Okay, Alex, we can start now. Okay, great. Well, oh, my clock says 12.29. Okay, well, um, welcome back everyone. So now um, we're going to continue and um, <clears throat> Luc de Rot is a professor at KU Leuven in Belgium. Uh, and among many other things, he was a former program chair for several uh, conferences, including ICML. Did a lot of seminal work in ILP, inductive logic programming and statistical relational learning. And a lot of it demonstrated with Problog, which is perhaps the most mature uh, probabilistic logic system. It's a certain point in the uh, trade-off space and um, uh, or perhaps the most successful of these systems. So uh, let me hand it to you, Luke. Okay, thanks a lot for the kind invitation and the nice uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, given all the background information on logics and probabilistic logics that was given this morning, I guess it's now time to move towards neurosymbolic uh, logics. And what I'm basically going to do is I'm going to give a recipe in going from logic to probabilistic logics and neurosymbolic uh, AI. Um, but let me start a bit with uh, motivating all of this. I mean, this is a book and a figure that you often see uh, in AI these days. It's um, the book by Daniel Kahneman about system one thinking fast and system two thinking slow. And the first you can, uh, when you think fa uh, fast, you can directly recognize people in a scene, for instance, you don't really have to think about that. And that's a task that, um, yeah, neural networks are extremely good at. And then there's, of course, thinking slow, the kind of reasoning that uh, we're all interested in, in, and that you need to do complex uh, problem solving, like, you know, planning a trip uh, and that kind of uh, thing. Um, but of course, many alternative terms that are closely related in one form or another. There is data versus knowledge driven approaches. People have used symbols or sub symbols. Hector Geffner likes to talk about solvers and learners. And I guess today a lot of people uh, feel that uh, in order to reach general uh, AI, that or genuine AI, we really need to have the best of both worlds and we read need to bridge the gap between system one and system two. Uh, the way in which to do this is something that most people do not agree on. And there you have different camps, so to say, uh, depending on whether you're more coming from a neural network or maybe from a KR uh, kind of perspective. In any case, if you are able to bridge this gap, we will be able to do a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, I mean, if you look at this kind of scene, uh, this is the kind of uh, question that you have to answer successfully at driver's license exams. And uh, there are typically like uh, multiple components to that. Uh, first, you need to, of course, to recognize uh, the objects in the scene. I mean, the cars, the pedestrians, um, the traffic signs and so on. And secondly, uh, well, you have to apply the rules of traffic in order to be able uh, to kind of give correct answers. And if we have to pass uh, this kind of test, well, you would expect that also uh, self-driving cars would uh, have to do this kind of reasoning. And what you surely don't want to do is like, um, you know, learn the rules of traffic from data because they're given, uh, they're written down, and you should be able to, in a sense, incorporate that kind of knowledge into neurosymbolic uh, AI system and systems that are able to learn and reason at the same time. Uh, the main paradigm today for thinking fast is, um, in any case, neural networks. I mean, it's extremely successful. It's all over the place. It has, um, um, yeah, reach a level of maturity that is, is simply impressive. And this is the hype of the moment. Uh, of course, what is often forgotten is that there's also these other paradigms in AI on which there has been a lot of progress over the past few decades. Uh, and this is especially like logic, which is uh, serving as the basis for knowledge representation or a lot of it. And then also like uh, probabilistic graphical models and probability 
uh, on which there's also like a, a rich body of work that has reached a level of, of maturity. Uh, what is more, their integration has been studied uh, deeply in this fields of probabilistic uh, programming, sometimes also probabilistic logic programming, as Fabrizio introduced, and statistical relational AI. Um, and um, what I'm going to uh, look at now is uh, neurosymbolic. And neurosymbolic is often viewed as combining this KR, this logic knowledge representation with neural networks. But one of the points that I want to make is that um, to get really neurosymbolic AI systems, you only you do not only need neural and logic, but you also need this probabilistic component. So. Uh, in this equation, it shows that the three components are important. And it's kind of important also to realize that probability is interpreted very broadly. Uh, I mean, both Benjamin and, um, and also um, uh, Fabio mentioned um, fuzzy, I guess. And um, fuzzy is often seen or used as an alternative to probability in neurosymbolic AI systems. Um, and um, yeah, I'm also going to tell you a little bit about fuzzy. Um, it's often viewed as an approximation of probabilistic reasoning in neurosymbolic, and um, that can lead to certain problems uh, because fuzzy is, is, has been invented to reason about vagueness and not really about uh, uncertainty. Uh, and in that regard, uh, there were some issues to be uh, tackled. Um, if you look at the neurosymbolic uh, AI systems today, then there is a whole alphabet soup of different systems. And in a sense, um, this state of the art is very similar to what we had in the old days, uh, you know, about 20 years ago when people were uh, talking about statistical relational learning and statistical relational AI, uh, it was very much the same and we're again playing the same game like, um, well, if you have a new system, it's kind of, of tempting to say, well, my system can do this and that and the other systems cannot do that. And you get this kind of comparisons and that is uh, to some extent hindering uh, progress. Uh, what we really, really need is a kind of understanding of the underlying uh, principles. And I feel that um, there's a lot of, of commonalities between these probabilistic logics and to neurosymbolic uh, AI systems. Uh, basically, uh, they share the same kind of problems. And because they share the same kind of problems uh, in like coping, for instance, with inference and in coping with grounding, um, it also turns out that very much the same solutions uh, will be uh, applying and that's like also one of the key messages that I want to give. I should also stress that neurosymbolic AI is uh, typically a very broad term and some people like uh, Yee and Choi would for instance say um, well, uh, you've got a neurosymbolic uh, AI system when you have words and the words would be the symbols. And of course, you could also uh, take that perspective. But I'm going to take uh, the more narrow perspective where a kind of uh, KR knowledge representation logic system is uh, to be taken uh, into account. And what is more? Uh, based on this uh, analysis that I'll make uh, of the statistical relational AI systems and their connection to neurosymbolic, I'll also provide a kind of recipe uh, for deriving neurosymbolic uh, AI systems. I'll argue that basically you can take any of these logics, uh, you can take uh, the appropriate fuzzy or probabilistic framework and then uh, inject neural predicates uh, and uh, arrive at the kind of uh, neurosymbolic uh, AI system. And this is especially uh, addressing one of the five or six categories that Henry Kautz um, mentioned in his keynote at uh, AAAI uh, 2020, I believe. Um, and that was also mentioned uh, by Fabio already. And um, in, in this kind of recipe, we'll provide a kind of interface between the neural and the symbolic uh, components. And I, I want to stress here that interfaces are different than pipelines because uh, in an interface you go in both directions and there is a common terminology, whereas in a pipeline it, it's only going in, in one direction, uh, so to say. Uh, and uh, yeah, that, that's less interesting. The recipe will go from logic to kind of probabilistic logic and then from probabilistic logic to uh, a kind of a neural uh, probabilistic uh, logic. Uh, the rest of the talk will go in three uh, parts. In the first part, I'll uh, give a little survey uh, building on top of uh, what Fabio and Benjamin and, and Fabrizio have already introduced uh, about um, 
neurosymbolic AI systems. I'll make a kind of distinction between a few categories. I'll then use uh, that material to propose a recipe. And I'm then in the last part gonna illustrate it on a couple of uh, systems that we have been developing uh, in our uh, lab, uh, the Problog that was already mentioned, but also it's a little uh, sibling uh, called Deep Stock Lock, which is based on an entirely different uh, semantic uh, framework. Um, so in the survey, uh, there's an extensive version of that that's uh, available on archive and that soon should be appearing in uh, a major journal. Uh, uh, we an analyze neurosymbolic AI along six, seven dimensions. And um, it turns out that um, the key dimension uh, will be that of, um, um, will be kind of, of, of going from logic to graphical models and then from graphical models to the neural networks. And we'll make a distinction between, in a sense, directed uh, versus undirected uh, graphical models between the proof theoretic and the um, um, and the model theoretic perspective. So here you see logic programs. I mean, this is uh, modeling the kind of alarm example from Judy Pro. I mean, there's burglaries, there is earthquakes, there is uh, uh, people that hear or not hear the alarm, and then there are rules. Um, rules like saying that Mary calls if she hears the alarm and uh, the alarm goes off. Um, given this kind of theory, you can build these proofs. Uh, there is like two proofs given for uh, calls Mary, one that depends on the alarm uh, being given by an earthquake, the other uh, being uh, a burglary. Uh, so that's one perspective. It's kind of the proof theoretic and, and you'll build proofs. The other is more the model theoretic perspective, which you find in set solvers, which you find in answer set programming systems. There are like logical statements given, and you're then looking for a kind of uh, possible world, a kind of model of that theory that captures, uh, well, a possible configuration that is in agreement that satisfies these constraints. And it's typical uh, that you would only write down uh, things that hold in that possible world and that everything that's not in the possible world would be assumed to be false. And so here you see that um, the four facts, uh, if you take these true and the others false, that all of these clauses or all the, of these rules are kind of uh, satisfied. Now that's like the logic as proofs, the logic uh, as a kind of model theoretic perspective, as kind of constraints. And it turns out that these two types uh, also occur very naturally in uh, probabilistic graphical models. And Fabrizio actually uh, uh, showed the way in that. Um, I mean, um, there is a close correspondence between propositional uh, probabilistic logic programs and uh, Bayesian networks. And uh, there's also like, um, and that's the proof theoretic perspective. It's the directed version, if you want. Uh, and on the right, you have like this standard Markov logic uh, network that's introduced. And there, the logic is used as constraints. The idea being that the higher the value that you find um, here, uh, the more important that constraint is. And if that uh, value is like infinity, uh, then it's kind of a hard constraint. Uh, with the soft constraints, um, I mean, uh, something becomes not impossible if it's not satisfied, it just becomes less, less likely. And it turns out that this kind of, of setting carries over to neurosymbolic uh, AI systems. Again, you have like this two major uh, uh, frameworks. Uh, you have the kind of the neural programs, which are uh, corresponding to the directed version, to the proof theoretic version, if you want. And then there is the other ones that uh, use logic as constraints and use the logic to regularize, in a sense, uh, your neural uh, networks. Um, and that is basically uh, what I'm going to talk about um, now. Um, if you look at the earliest uh, neurosymbolic AI system, then you'll probably end up with KBAN from Jude Chavlik and uh, Tawel, and that's uh, about 30 years old. And what they did, uh, they would work with this kind of propositional uh, prologue programs, uh, like the ones that you find on the left of these slides. And they would then kind of do some kind of rewriting, um, and um, they would kind of uh, build up some kind of Proof trees, uh, and on the right you see this and or uh, tree, 
Uh, there are like end nodes uh, depicting conjunction, and there are like or nodes uh, depicting uh, disjunction. And so you get in a sense an end or graph with at the leaves of the tree, uh, you get, so to say, the inputs uh, for the prediction. And at the top of uh, the tree, you get like the output, uh, what you want to predict. And that's a purely logical um, configuration. But of course, if you're there already, it is kind of natural to extend that uh, and or structure into a neural network. And the way to do that is, you know, you're going to connect uh, all of the uh, input nodes to the next level. Um, and, and so you're going to do the kind of connections, connectionist approach uh, on all of these nodes. Maybe you add a couple of hidden nodes like the gray one here. And then what you do is you just apply backprop and you learn. Um, and this is one of the uh, earliest um, uh, neurosymbolic AI systems. And uh, to, to uh, understand the visionary uh, views that Shaul and, and, uh, that Taul and, and Shavlik had, um, it's also instructive to see that, you know, after, uh, well, introducing this approach, they were continuing in, in, in ongoing work in like reconstructing, um, you know, the learned program from the neural network. And in a sense, that's one of the first approaches to explainable AI from neural networks because they wanted uh, to get explanations in a sense for uh, the data. And so this shows uh, this, this approach is very close in spirit to, um, you know, um, the proof theoretic approach in the directed graphical models in statistical relation AI. And it's also, you know, taken over and still very, very actual in today's uh, approaches to neurosymbolic. I mean, here there is uh, the work by uh, the group around Andre Kuzelka. Uh, with lifted relational neural networks, which is doing something like that. It's using a fuzzy rather than a probabilistic interpretation. Uh, but there's also like the neural tier improver that is based on that principle. And in the NTP, uh, what you get is uh, there is this example database on the left uh, where you have like your logical uh, clauses. And uh, then maybe you have a query and the query says grandpa of uh, is Abe the grandfather Pa of Bart, but it turns out that there is like uh, the, the predicate grandpa of is not in the database, it is not defined. And so um, what they uh, provide is a very interesting uh, notion of um, kind of soft uh, unification. And what they do in the soft unification is they, well, they would observe that if you embed these predicates, if you embed the constants that uh, grandfather of and grandpa of are very close in this embedding space. And so they would actually give a high score to this kind of um, kind of match. It would not be a perfect score because, well, then you would have to have an, an exact match. And so by uh, building this kind of uh, soft matching and, and soft proving uh, proof tree, they would get the structure of the neural uh, network and train uh, after that. Uh, in both cases, uh, what you see is that the logic is, um, well, is used to derive the network. And once you get it, you know, it, it, it enters the uh, neural network and it's forgotten. And, and so it becomes, in a sense, impossible to reason logically afterwards. Um, let's also look at the rightmost, I mean, the kind of directed version, the soft constrained version, the model theoretic version. And in that regard, there is a very nice approach by the group of uh, Hee van den Broek, who will talk uh, also tomorrow. It's um, a very pure uh, approach uh, in a, the, introduced in a paper at ICML 2018, and it's the semantic loss. Uh, what they observe is that if you have like natural neural networks, and you do multi-class classification, you know, without a softmax, um, then you might up, end up with uh, output nodes, uh, such as class one has um, a kind of confidence of 80, uh, point, point 80 um, uh, class three of 0. 0.9, and probably that's something you don't want because in multi-class classification, only one of these classes should be true. And so what they do, is they enforce a constraint, and the constraint is listed uh, on the right. Uh, the constraint says uh, should be exactly one of these output nodes should fire or should be true uh, at the same time. Uh, and then they kind of rewrite that using uh, probabilistic logic principles uh, into this kind of expression. 
uh, which uh, computes the probability that the constraint is satisfied um, if you have uh, this kind of uh, configuration. And that probability is then used, you know, as a basis for uh, what is called a semantic loss. Um, and uh, this, uh, basically, if the constraint is not violate, vi is, is not satisfied, uh, you kind of uh, will give uh, uh, a loss, an extra loss uh, to the um, uh, to your function, and then you're gonna um, you, you're, you're gonna correct the neural network for that. And you see here very similar uh, formulas as the ones that Fabrizio has shown uh, for probabilistic logics. Again, that uh, kind of approach where you use you know the logic um, to kind of um, to kind of regularize. Is, is quite uh, fashionable. I mean, if you look at logic tensor networks, or if you look at semantic based regularization, you get logical expressions. And again, uh, well, the loss function will be defined on that. And um, this is um, actually uh, um, getting a similar kind of problem because uh, the logic is, you know, encoded in the regularizer, but it's not used really to reason uh, logically. And so, um, um, well, it, it actually shows that um, there were these two uh, approaches, the directed and the undirected, the proof theoretic, the model theoretic, and that this is also, uh, this distinction is also important for, uh, you know, the neural program version versus the uh, using a loss function, the logic as a kind of loss function to regularize uh, the network. Uh, a second uh, dimension, is well so 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 this actually um in in both cases what you get is um that the logic is encoded in the network and that you lose in a sense the ability uh to reason logically with that in any case this allows us to uh, say that while well, star and neurosymbolic that they share already a lot of uh, problems and that the similar solutions uh will uh, apply um, a second uh, point that um, I'll be addressing uh, is um, this uh, recipe that I'm going to introduce. Um, the recipe uh, will allow us now to uh, take any logic uh, and combine it with any kind of uh, neural network uh, approach uh, where the, uh, the neural predicates will be uh, provide the uh, interface uh, between uh, the two. And in, in my uh, opinion, if you combine two things, uh, if you integrate like different paradigms, you want the originals to have them as a kind of uh, special case. So let me give you the recipe. Um, and so the recipe is quite simple and I'm already gonna use deep problem to uh, illustrate it a little. Uh, what you have to do is you select your favorite logic um, in a sense, uh, you could take any logic that Benjamin was talking about. And uh, here you see like uh, logical facts, like Mary has the alarm. Um, you see also like the typical kind of rules that you find in Prolog, uh, like uh, you call if the alarm goes off and you hear the alarm. And then um, there will also be uh, neural networks. And in this kind of case, we assume that uh, there is like an image about, um, you know, the house. Uh, and um, well, if, if uh, and that will be used to, to trigger the alarm or not, uh, or to say whether there is a burglary or not. And there will also be a signal that uh, you, you might hear and that uh, could be connected to the earthquake. And so you have like these two neural networks, one that's um, accepting the signals, the other that accepting the images. And what it does is it actually predicts whether or not there is a burglary and whether or not there is a kind of earthquake. And this is what we're going to call neural predicates. Uh, neural predicates were already mentioned by Fabio, and I'm going to uh, also go a little bit deeper in that because neural predicates are at the heart of neurosymbolic uh, AI. So that is like um, step two. I mean, we have logic. We have neural networks. We interpret the neural networks as so-called neural predicates, and then um, I mean, if you just have this, well, you have zero one, and so uh, with zero one you can't do, you know, stochastic gradient descent. It's all discrete, so you basically want to get a kind of 
uh, numbers in there and the numbers will uh, need to assign you know uh, semantics and you can take a probabilistic or a fuzzy interpretation of that there's lots of different choices and they will have an influence on this as well uh, so that is like step three that you have to select um, and once you have that you can build proofs. I mean, we've seen proofs in the K-band examples. We've seen proofs already in Problog. Um, and so here you see like uh, this proof tree. I mean, if on the basis of uh, Mary, I mean, if, if you want to determine whether Mary will call after um, there is this image uh, and this signal, uh, well, to determine that, well, you can actually look at your theory, calls if alarm and here's alarm. And so, um, essentially, uh, this is the kind of proof structure that you will then get. It's again an and or tree uh, that is listed here. Uh, here's alarm has a probabilistic value uh, on the previous slide. And for this image, you know, our neural networks predicts uh, a, point one, a point zero 0.01 value for burglary and a point 0.8 value for uh, earthquake. And uh, so um, what it will do is this neural predicates will actually go underneath this proof tree and they will correspond to the leaves. Uh, the leaves will be the, the leaves here of the logical part. This will be uh, the neural predicates and the kind of, of probabilistic facts that we will be getting here. And underneath we will get, be getting this uh, images and this, this neural network, so to say. And once you have that, well, all that you need to do is kind of uh, replace the and and or by a multiplication and an addition in a particular simmering. And then you can start, uh, you know, uh, doing backprop. You get the examples at the top and you push down the gradient uh, into um, the uh, neural networks and you train uh, your parameters. I mean, that is the ID. I realize I <laughs> illustrated at a very, very high level, but I'm gonna illustrate it later with uh, deep prob lock and deep stock lock. <laughs> so you get uh, uh, a better flavor uh, of that. Um, the other part is that, um, you know, the numbers are kind of important. I was talking about uh, discrete versions. I was talking about um, a probabilistic version, a fuzzy version. And essentially, if you look at these circuits, um, well, this is the way that you can represent uh, Boolean expressions. Uh, you can represent this, uh, uh, this expression in logic. Uh, in the following way, at the leaves, you'll get like the A, B, and C, and you're going to give them a label. Uh, that label will be one or zero or true or false if you work Boolean, or it will be a value between zero and one if you work in a fuzzy or a probabilistic logic. And then you get like these other nodes, like this end node. I mean, this end node will determine how you combine the two uh, leaves uh, to that particular level. And then you see also that the result of the end is combined with the result of the implication. And so the blue boxes are in a sense the operators on the leaves that go lower, very much like the end and or uh, or the multiplication and addition that we had uh, before. Now there are many different uh, things to do. We can look at this parametric circuit. Uh, we can decide which operators we're gonna use. Um, I mean, uh, that, uh, I mean, if you use a fuzzy, that will be different than if you use a Boolean logic. And then there are the labeling functions uh, as well. So let's look at uh, Boolean logic. I mean, this is all pretty well known. In a Boolean logic, this is the kind of truth tables for, you know, the operation, the blue box ends. Um, this is the way that you would propagate from leaves uh, uh, to, to kind of parents. And this would be the one for the implication. There's nothing special about that. If you work into a probabilistic logic, then you actually have to, uh, you can't work with the original circuit because you have to make sure that the numbers will be probabilities. And uh, there is this particular instance uh, that's called the disjoint sum problem. I mean, if you have the probability of A uh, or B, 
um, that probability is, um, you know, it, it's not the sum of A and B, but it's the sum of A and B minus their intersection. And that actually means that if you uh, work with this kind of, of settings, it's typical to kind of map that, to kind of transform that into, uh, to compile that into another structure where your computations will go directly. I mean, this step is called knowledge compilation. It's at the heart of a lot of uh, fast probabilistic inference methods. And once you had, have that, well, then you can replace the or by addition and you can replace the ands by uh, multiplication and you can compute with this. So the expensive step, because probabilistic inference is expensive, I mean, that's what uh, Fabio and Benjamin were talking about as well. Uh, the expensive step here is this one, but once you have uh, the resulting circuits, everything is, is kind of uh, fast. And then there are the fuzzy uh, logics that you can use. And there is a wide variety of these fuzzy logics. Again, Benjamin already uh, mentioned some. There are these fundamental uh, triangular norms like uh, Gödel, Product, or Lukasovic uh, that are defined in particular ways. And if you take these, then you can, I mean, that's in a sense giving you the conjunction, if you want. That's the blue box that we have here. Uh, and from that, you can like derive some other ones. Uh, the advantage of uh, fuzzy is of course that you get something continuous and differentiable. Um, the disadvantage of this is that there's quite some problems with this. I mean, things that you would expect to hold logically, like if A implies B and B implies C, you would expect that also A implies C holds. But in some of these uh, logics, that is not the case. Uh, there's also problems with gradients. Uh, there's a very nice uh, paper by uh, Emil van Klieken in the AI journal that appeared last year or the year before. And um, so, but a lot of people in neurosymbolic are actually resorting to these fuzzy logics. And the reason is not because, um, well, fuzzy logic is so great, uh, the reason, or, or they want to use it for the reason why people have invented fuzzy logic, which is as a, as a kind of measure of vagueness. I mean, like you're told to a certain uh, degree um, I mean, that's the way it was originally intended, uh, but um, they actually use it um, as a kind of replacement for probability, and that is uh, sometimes uh, causing surprises. Uh, it's also been used like that in, um, it's also been used like that in uh, uh, pro um, probabilistic logics in statistical relational AI. I mean, we have the framework of Markov logic that was introduced by um, Fabrizio and uh, in, in this kind of Markov logic you get possible walls and these possible walls you know they will assign true and false to the different uh, atoms that you have like burglary and alarm uh, but there's also like the extension of uh, um, Markov logic to a fuzzy logic uh, it's PSL it's a very efficient and very well-known system by the group uh, around Lise Couture and what they do is they uh, use these uh, fuzzy logics and in these fuzzy logics you get like walls with um, where there is this vagueness notion uh, that so there's no burglary but there is a kind of burglary of degree 0.7 uh, the alarm goes off with degree 0.5 and so um, this is, is a kind of different uh, setting. The advantage, however, is that it's much faster. You get like convex optimization problems and, and stuff like that. And you can do a lot of, of interesting stuff. To, but there's also like some caveats uh, to be mentioned here. Okay, so what I now mentioned is the way to go from these logics to these probabilistic logics or these fuzzy logics. Uh, but I haven't really mentioned how the recipe also goes to the uh, neurosymbolic methods. And the way to go to the neurosymbolic methods is then, well, you've got these leaves here. I mean, this could be like burglary and earthquake. Well, we've seen that we can actually attach a neural network to compute the labels uh, that you would need to get. And uh, that is what you get at the bottom. And then you get like this neurosymbolic uh, systems. Uh, either, you know, the fuzzy ones or the probabilistic ones. I mean, the difference being that um, in the probabilistic ones you've done, you need to do the kind of compilation and then you get this kind of, of structure. So that's a little bit the high level picture in, uh, you know, going for this uh, recipe. Uh, the rest of the time I'll devote to 
you know, introducing the problog and deep stock log as a special case uh, of this recipe as a kind of illustration that indeed the recipe works. And um, it also corresponds to like two different models or programs. Um, I mean, if you look at random graphs, um, if you look at graphs, you can define two types of probabilistic models on that. Uh, the first is the random graph model. And in the random graph, what you do is like every edge is in or out with a particular probability. And that's very similar to, you know, uh, the distribution semantics, uh, problog and related systems where, you know, every fact is in or out with a particular probability. Uh, and that's like this probabilistic logic programs uh, that you frequently find. But then there's also this alternative view in which you have like random walks uh, through the graph. And uh, that is very similar to um, what you have in probabilistic grammars. Essentially, if you're in a node, you, you're looking for paths and you can, you know, if you're in the node of the graph, you can take any other direction, which is also what you can do with probabilistic grammars and a framework called stochastic logic uh, programs. Okay, if you look at deep problog, uh, and that will also hold for deep stock log, actually, it's actually a probabilistic logic to which we inject uh, neural uh, networks. And the advantage of this is that, um, well, you retain the full expressivity of uh, the logic. I mean, uh, problog is an extension of prolog, so it is Turing equivalent. It's a programming language. And uh, the problog is an extension of problog, so also that is 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 what it, what it takes. It has also very clear semantics, and uh, yeah, Fabrizio did a good job in kind of introducing all the semantics of these uh, probabilistic logics. Um, and in contrast to some of the earlier systems that I was showing, um, the logic uh, where the logic is pushed into the network here, you maintain both the logical component that will be your circuit and you maintain the neural networks, which is like uh, at the leaves uh, of this. And so you get several advantages of this. From prolog to problog, let me go quick here because I'm repeating what um, Fabrizio was mentioning. You've got your prolog program, you have some proofs, and then the seminal contribution by Sato and Poole and, and others is that they were looking for this uh, unification of logic and probability theory. And so they said like what we need is I mean, random variables must become propositional variables or they, they become kind of equivalent uh, depending on, on what uh, hat you put on. And that is the interface that you get between logic and uh, probability. And then um, you can uh, look at uh, queries. You can try to answer them and ask what is the probability of alarm. And here the problem, uh, why you need knowledge compilation, why you need to compile uh, these 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 formulas and these initial structures uh, is is obvious because here we've got two proofs for alarm one via burglary another via uh, earthquake and so the probability of alarm is the probability that there is a burglary or that there is an earthquake and it's very tempting to say well the probability of alarm is simply the sum of these two uh, probabilities. But of course, that doesn't hold in general, because uh, you should also subtract the intersection. Um, it can be that burglary and earthquake are true at the same time. And uh, if you don't uh, subtract that, you will end up with probabilities that are larger than one. And that is, of course, uh, not uh, the idea. And so that is the motivation for doing this knowledge compilation and to avoiding uh, that. Fabrizio showed this close correspondence between propositional logic programs and Bayesian networks. Um, I, I want to stress that, you know, these probabilistic programs uh, are really programs, so they are much more expressive than standard uh, Bayesian networks in the sense that you've got something that is Turing equivalent. Um, it's also much better for relational uh, domains, like uh, the simplest kind of relational domains are these so-called plates. Uh, here you've got like um, uh, Bayesian networks where with repeated structure, uh, every plate, every rectangle is uh, repeated, uh, the S1 for each student, the difficult, uh, the, the C1 for each course, and you can kind of unroll uh, that Bayesian network 
uh, by kind of um, uh, representing it like that. And that is the so-called relational versions uh, that are at the heart of statistical relational learning and for which these probabilistic logics are uh, very uh, adequate in expressing these very natural, um, unlike the standard. Well, the, the plate notation is, but you can even go further and, and more expressive uh, than that. Uh, there's various applications. We've applied it to, you know, uh, modeling uh, massive uh, multiplayer online games. We've applied it in robotic settings to, you know, reason about occluded objects. Uh, to track uh, as well, um, to learn, you know, affordances in, in a robotic setting where you get a kind of probabilistic, um, where you get a kind of probabilistic um, um, strips notation um, where, um, you know, on the, on the left you see like there is this uh, robot hand uh, tapping objects and then you can uh, reason about the, uh, the displacement. So this is uh, an extension of problog towards continuous distribution. So you can reason in continuous space, um, for instance, about distances and, and you can then use that for a kind of planning. I mean, the work is already uh, a little bit older, but um, yeah, the challenge now is to kind of couple this to neurosymbolic uh, approaches and, and really getting there actually. I mean, these are this um, continuous extensions where you reason about um, uh, this kind of um, yeah, uh, probability distributions. There's applications in biology. Uh, and if you want to try it out, there is a, a good website where you can just play. Uh, you can type in your own programs uh, and then you can kind of try it out and, and play, so to say. But that's probabilistic logics. I promised to talk about deep probabilistic logics. And let's go from um, problog to deep problog. And the central idea is really this neural predicate that we introduced, uh, where you have like, um, um, for instance, a neural network that takes MNIST images and produces an output um, as a kind of uh, confidence levels, but you can interpret it as a kind of probability distribution. And uh, we were looking for a similar idea as Asato, like how can we merge in a sense the basic concepts in logic and the basic concepts in neural network and then it's very natural to arrive at this uh, neural predicate neural networks are becoming neural predicates and they provide the interface between the two uh, frameworks uh, if you have that well and this is again uh, been taken over by other systems like neurasp and uh, the system that uh, and deep asp that um, um, Fabio was, was showing, uh, what you then have is this kind of declarations uh, where you say, well, the input is like, uh, this is a neural predicate, it's called digit, the input is an MNIST image and the output is one of the values between zero and nine, and this is kind of translated uh, into uh, an annotated disjunction. If you fill out one of these um, MNIST images, you get something that looks like an annotated disjunction, at least semantically. Uh, and that's all you need as a primitive uh, to get your neuro symbolic system. Um, on the right, you see like a couple of examples of this um, popular uh, addition task uh, where you have like two MNISTs and uh, their results. And uh, to get that, uh, all you need to do is uh, define that addition predicate. Uh, and that addition predicate, uh, if you then call it uh, with a particular uh, instance, for instance, here, this 358, what uh, it will tell you, it will tell you that digit, uh, the first digit maps on a, uh, a number, the second match maps on another number, and the sum of the two numbers must be equal to eight. Uh, and that acts as a strong constraint on the learning. And um, what it actually does is that um, it will constrain the learning of uh, the underlying neural predicates uh, digit, uh, because the examples you will be given is just uh, on the things you see on the right. I mean, three, five, eight, zero, four, four. It's at the level of addition. You will never have to give an example at the level of digit. Uh, that will be. Uh, processed by uh, the, the kind of neurosymbolic AI system. And uh, the reason that it works 
is that this acts as a kind of constraint because if you know that eight is the sum of the two numbers, then you know four, four works, three, five works, two, six works, but you also know that two, two does not sum up to eight and so that would not be considered. You can then compare, you know, to standard neural networks. This will, of course, not work as well um, because, well, it doesn't take into account that kind of constraint. And so what you do is um, uh, better than that. Uh, this is, uh, of course, very simple. Uh, you can uh, extend it a little bit. You can look at like lists of these MNIST images and uh, to process these, you get um, this kind of modified definition in prologue of addition. And again, you get this same uh, neural predicate called digit um, that you don't observe, uh, but that you still learn uh, explicitly uh, by giving examples at the level of multi-addition to lists and their sum, uh, so to say. Um, what's also cool is that uh, you can learn uh, the, the kind of other probabilistic parameters. So you get really not just the neural networks as special key, but also the probabilistic aspect. I mean, here is a noisy version. It's again toyish, but it's a noisy version of addition, like with a particular probability of noisy, you'll output, you know, a random number uh, that's uniformly selected. Uh, if it's not noisy, you produce the uh, standard addition. And um, yeah, you can, can see then that uh, deep problem with explicit noise handling is actually uh, performing pretty well. And in addition to performing pretty well, it actually recovers uh, the noise level that is inherent in these, uh, in these um, uh, problem programs. Inference and learning, uh, let me go quick here. It's again following the same kind of scheme. Uh, you've got your program here. And so what is happening is you kind of ground out your program and that's already propositional on the left hand. You then look at, you know, this kind of and or tree, if you like, uh, you look at the conditions under which the query of interest here, Mary calls is true. And um, well, that expression is listed here. This is a logical expression. And what you do is you have to compile that logical expression into a circuit. The circuit is listed here and you see like at the top, you have the predicate that you're trying to learn. At uh, the bottom, you have like uh, these parameter, uh, you have like these probabilistic facts, these parameters, and uh, you've got the end or uh, nodes uh, in the middle. And um, in order to turn it into something arithmetic after compilation, it is safe. Uh, it is actually safe. Um, to kind of uh, turn the ends into uh, multiplication and the ors into uh, addition. Uh, this is, is what you get um, as well. Um, if you have the uh, neural predicates on top of that, well, it's actually very much the same story, except that uh, the leaves of the circuit uh, will now be the neural uh, predicates, the kind of calls to the neural predicates, and underneath these neural predicates, you'll get the neural networks. And uh, so this is kind of differentiable. And what you will be getting is that your examples are at the top, they're at the level of addition, and you kind of push down your gradient from, you know, the top to the leaves, to the parameters, and then from the, the kind of parameters of these um, uh, leaves you push it down to the parameters of the neural network and you can simply uh, train as well. Um, now there's one thing that I'm just going to mention, not really explain. Uh, these circuits, I mean I'm using this plus and multiplication, but um, there's some very nice property of this and that's actually that, um, you know, if you have the properties of your addition and multiplication if they form a semi-ring, then, uh, well, you can use the circuits uh, to for all kinds of, of purposes. It's a bit like, um, you know, in, in Bayesian network inference, there is the max uh, uh, product and the sum product algorithm uh, that are essentially the same. It's just that you replace, you know, uh, max by sum or sum by max, and uh, that is like the, the abstract uh, addition uh, symbol that you have. And there is plenty of them that you can use. 
uh, to get uh, interesting other uh, behaviors. Um, you can, you know, add in fuzzy logics, you can add gradients. There's a gradient centering, you can use gradients to do like this continuous uh, distributions. Um, first, I thought uh, the semi-rings was uh, pretty exotic, but now we use gradients and uh, we, we use semi-rings uh, all over the place in a sense. Um, some experiments. Um, maybe I'll, I'll go very quick on that. Um, um, let me maybe skip these. Well, we can simulate the neural tear improver. I'd rather go for um, the um, we can simulate the, the soft unification of uh, the neural tear improver by using kind of soft unification predicate. Uh, and uh, you can do things like um, uh, reason about, you know, uh, kind of uh, poker hands, like uh, with partial observability, like what will be the most, uh, uh, what's the likelihood that you will win, uh, that kind of thing. But let me go to the second system um, that I want to illustrate and that is uh, deep stock lock. Maybe I should also mention that um, problock uh, or deep problock has been uh, applied in a reinforcement learning setting to define a kind of probabilistic uh, shield um, that can be used to kind of uh, reason about which actions are safe and to kind of uh, get safe uh, reinforcement learning uh, techniques. Uh, that was just published at HKI. Uh, but let's look at the second case, which is like the grammar based case. And uh, deep stock lock is this uh, little sibling of deep prob lock. Um, based on this different semantics, you know, random walks rather than random graphs or grammars rather than uh, graphical models. And um, to get there, um, let's now assume my favorite logics is uh, kind of context-free grammars. Here you've got uh, standard context-free grammars. I mean, you have like non-terminals like E um, and then you have like uh, the kind of uh, terminals uh, that you find at the bottom. And so you can, um, um, you can, um, um, I'll show that it's a logic DC, so I'll show it um, uh, because it maps directly to Prolog. Um, so it's like, um, yeah, here you get this, this kind of parse trees and um, you can get uh, probabilistic extensions of that. Uh, what are these probabilistic context-free grammars? I mean, essentially, what you get is that at every non-terminal, uh, the sum of the probability uh, you add pro at, at every rule you add a prob probabilistic label, and the sum of the probabilities will be equal uh, to one in a sense. Like so, here you have two rules for e, and their sum must be equal to one, and that corresponds in a sense to the fact that if you're in a random walk and you're in a node, well, the sum of the of following any of the outgoing edges must be equal to one because you're going to randomly sample one of these. Here you're going to randomly sample one of these, uh, uh, these, um, um, going to sample one of these, these, these rules in a sense. And so you get uh, parse trees. And uh, given that you have a parse tree, you can look at the probability of the parse. It's just the probability of all rules that you have applied multiplied. And if you've applied the rule more than once, you just multiply more than once. I mean, that's the probability of the parse tree. And it's very convenient to look at what is the most likely parse uh, of something. Then there is the other thing, and that's the kind of uh, unification-based grammar. And here uh, we so, go. Sorry, Luke, just a reminder that uh, please try to wrap up in three minutes. Yes, that was the plan. That will work. Okay. So um, you've got um, the, um, here you've got like the unification based version of a definite clause grammar. Uh, what does it do? I mean, it adds like unification to the non-terminals in order to, you know, pass on information or for instance, to pass on number agreement. I mean, in natural language, if you want to have agreement uh, in number between the subject and the verb, then it's very convenient to add that, you know, as kind of arguments. Here it is used to kind of uh, compute the result of a particular parse. And um, that kind of mechanism is, is very, maps directly to prolog and then parse trees are proof trees. And there is a, a kind of immediate correspondence between the two. And that is the connection to like a kind of logic uh, if, if you want. 
Um, now, if you have uh, two extensions of grammars, one towards probability, the other is towards unification, it's kind of natural to combine them. And that is uh, what you can call stochastic definite clause grammars. Um, and this is um, what's illustrated here. We can now, you know, look at uh, the most likely parse and the most likely result of the parse um, because um, we, we find the proof and we find the probability and then we find different uh, kind of, of results for that. Um, the um, next step is uh, to repeat the same uh, choice that we've done before. I mean, before, well, we have said, like, instead of having, like, numbers, like two and three, we can inject neural predicates and use these to um, get uh, to recognize certain MNIST images. And uh, that is uh, what you then get is neural definite clause grammars. And that is a deep stock lock uh, that, that you're actually getting. And uh, um, this is the parse tree. The parse tree can map directly this is the prologue version it's not important that you understand it this is you know the way it maps to prologue and then this is then the way it maps onto uh, a kind of circuit now the key advantage of uh, this model is that in contrast to the kind of probabilistic graphical models and to uh, uh, prologue and, and pita and, and, and all these other systems uh, that here you can sum up the probabilities of parse trees. And if there's multiple parses for E1, then you can actually add up their probabilities. Uh, you don't suffer from this disjoint sum problem, so you don't have to do the compilation in a sense. Um, okay, I think I'm, uh, and that means also that it works way faster than uh, the other systems like uh, dproblog and NeurASP. Uh, it, it goes way f further than that. You can recognize grammars of handwritten digits and, and stuff uh, like that. But let me conclude. Um, I think if you study neurosymbolic, well, you have to get uh, the best of three worlds, uh, neural logics, and then probability and fuzzy. Uh, star AI and neurosymbolic uh, share many issues uh, and so similar solutions. And I've uh, provided a recipe for, uh, well, turning any kind of logic or symbolic system, if you like, into um, a neurosymbolic one. Thank you. All right, great. Uh, well, thank you, Luke. That was fantastic. Um, so let me go to some questions. Um, one of these, um, I think, was just generally directed uh, maybe to the to everybody, but um, I'll choose uh, you to uh, answer this. Um, <clears throat> let me find it for a second. Uh, what would be the limitation? Oh, wait. A second. Oh, could you discuss how a neurosymbolic model addresses the simple grounding problem in the context of image recognition where there are multiple confounding objects in the image? Um, yeah, simple grounding. Well, you, yes, I can, you can apply it to that. And some people like uh, with logic tensor networks have, uh, applied it to this kind of, of setting. Um, yeah, how, how you, you use the, the symbol grounding with that. Uh, I think it's a pretty hard question. Um, different symbols. Could correspond to different neural predicates, and that would be one way of doing it. But there's certainly other ways of of of, of working with that, in a sense. Um, uh, I can imagine a direct uh, usage of something like dproblog, where you provide relational constraints based mm -hmm. on uh, physical common sense. Yes, and that you know allows you to conclude something as a shadow or something as opposed to Black. Yes. yes, that's the way uh, logic tensor that there are experiments with logic tensor networks that that have done that in, in vision. Uh, what would be the limitation of a hybrid approach combining knowledge base with neural network? Like, is there a theoretical limit? Is it bound by the knowledge base structure or the neural net logic? 
Um, well, I, I guess the key challenge today is like scaling it up because you inherit like um, both frameworks, but that means you get both the good and the bad about it. And um, some of these techniques, uh, as Fabio has shown, are computationally expensive. And um, I mean, if you look at probabilistic inference, there's been loads of work on making that faster. Uh, and that is a line of research that is continuing and continuing. And um, I guess um, more of that can still be incorporated into these neurosymbolic systems. I guess the new trend is to go towards sampling uh, to do inference. And um, that is one of the what well, that is one of the challenges and, and one of the current limitations in a sense. Uh, but if you, I mean, the reason for using this kind of systems is really if you have knowledge that you can kind of specify in one of these formal languages, um, then I think uh, while well, the learning should speed up and knowledge should compensate for data, you would have to you would expect that you need less data then. Uh, related to that, there have been efforts to parallelize Prolog during the 80s and aughts by, for example, uh, uh, Mitty. How do you see the possibilities to parallelize Problog slash Dproblog analogously? Um, I think it's possible in principle, like one of the things is that you get, uh, you may have different uh, circuits for different examples. And that would be a very natural way of, of parallelizing everything. Uh, you could, uh, for the different circuits, you know, you could process them in parallel and um, there's a lot of options there. That would be quite natural. Um, what is the difference between a parse tree and a proof? The difference between, well, from a logical perspective, I would say there is no difference because parse trees becomes proofs. Um, because yeah it's just a different kind of notation in a sense right um but if you you represent the grammar inside the logic and then you you reason at the kind of meta level i mean which benjamin was kind of talking about as well um well the parse trees become proofs and so 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 that that's a pretty nice correspondent and that was was recognized a long time ago in the early days of natural language processing before uh, neural networks were so popular uh, people would handcraft these um, uh, these uh, rules and uh, would then go through all kind of proving uh, te techniques or parsing techniques um, and, and there's a whole part i mean you, you can map it almost one to one uh, what they do there and and um, what what is done in in Prolog um, and there was a lot of work on natural language processing in Prolog actually as well. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you so much, Luke. Okay, uh, thank you. Great. All right. Um, now.